We're going to talk a lot of conference tournament stuff here in our next segment with Kyle Hunter of huntersportspicks.com and also bangthebook.com. And we talk a lot about money line rollovers. We talk about looking for futures prices in these conference tournaments here. We also talk about hedging. And there are a lot of different ways that you can go about this futures market here in the month of March. And one of them, if you're a sports better, you talk about prop swap. Let me tell you, it's one of the coolest things I've seen in a very long time. Here's how prop swap works. Let's say you lay a $100 futures bet on Michigan to win the NCAA championship. They win their first two games and you decide, you know what? I want to guarantee some profit here. Well, you can list it for sale on prop swap and get paid early. It's that simple. Last year, for example, Barry from Las Vegas turned a $10 Loyola ticket into $1,000 after just four games by selling on prop swap. So just gives you another opportunity, gives you some different outs here in the futures betting market. So you can go to propswap.com slash BTB to get started. Again, propswap.com slash BTB. Legal in a lot of states. We'll have Ian on uh, here in the month of March to talk a little bit more about prop swap. But you can go get a feel for what they have going on. Check out what's available. Also see what's for sale here over at propswap.com slash BTB. We got one more guest, one more segment left for this Tuesday edition of Bang Wood segment with Kyle Hunter of huntersportspicks.com and also bangthebook.com. Kyle, how's it going today, man? Going well, man. I always look forward to these shows. I do too. I always look forward to them. And then, you know, Blog Talk Radio does its usual shenanigans <laughs> and bullshit here today. So doing things a little bit differently as we're recording on Skype, editing and cobbling together the show, trying to get it out to you as quick as we possibly can here with three conference tournaments starting tonight. The Patriot, the Big South, and the Horizon, the A-Sun, started last night. We talked about that one last Friday. So, Kyle, before we get into these specific conference tournaments, we will cover seven of them on today's segment. Let's talk about some general notes here of things that people want to look for. Yeah, I think there's several things that people should know, you know, ahead of time before you dive deep into each conference. First of all, you know, there's a big difference between neutral site tournaments and home uh, normal home locations for conference tournaments. Uh, in totals betting, the unders have been much better on neutral sites. Um, you know, it's split exactly even, 253 and 253 on normal uh, home locations. So uh, the unders 52.2% on neutrals in a conference tournament game. And keep in mind, this is on a closing line. These are very commonly bet down. So the opening line would certainly be higher than 52.2% on the under. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was, Totals of 149 and a half or higher on a neutral site in conference tournaments, 191 and 148 to the under on the closing line. That's 56.3%. Now, let me ask you this. I'm kind of curious to get your take on something like this. We talk about unders being good on neutral or at neutral sites. Do you feel like the under is stronger early in the tournament because it's a neutral site and the teams are getting used to it? Or is the under stronger later in the tournament when fatigue can be more of a factor and the games are increasing in importance? This is a tough question. I don't think I know the answer to this because, you know, you say, well, a team's not used to that location. So the first game would be lower for shooting percentages. But there are some really strong angles for both teams uh, playing on a back-to-back in that second game, the under has been very good. I think the under probably is even better uh, multiple days once you get later into the tournament, partially also because it means more. You know, that game, you're, you're that much closer, especially in these small conferences. You're not going to make it unless you get to, uh, unless you win the automatic berth. You know, most of these teams are not going to get the at-large. So I think the games mean more and you play the day before. So I would lean toward that. However, you know, I don't think that the under is a bad play on the first day either because, you know, the shooting backdrops are different. Uh, if you're used to playing there, then I think that, you know, the longer in the tournament it goes, uh, the better the under would be without any rest. But, you know, the neutral sites where you're not used to playing there at all, uh, I think the under has some value early on and probably even more later. All right. So, again, we talk about totals for conference tournaments, 52.2% to the under on a neutral floor, exactly 50% on the campus sites. So what about some ATS uh, considerations for the conference tournaments? Yeah, favorites overall are 50.7% ATS. So favorites have been a little bit better. That's a really large sample size. Uh, But I wanted to point out that laying a big number has been unprofitable. Uh, Dogs at 15 points or more, 67 and 46 ATS, that's 59.3%. This makes a lot of sense to me. You take a team that's a huge underdog, 
They've likely been uh, pretty bad here at the end of the regular season. They probably didn't even care at the end of the regular season. Now they care because this is their last chance. Um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense that underdogs of 15 points or more uh, would cover at a pretty good rate. Now, obviously, you're not going to see too many of those because, you know, most teams aren't going to be underdogs by that many points. But something to keep in mind when you go to laying a big number in conference tournaments, as we said, you know, laying a big number when it comes to the end of the regular season can make a lot of sense. But here in conference tournaments, it is not. Another one that I wanted I wanted to point out, rested teams at least a day off in between their games, playing against uh, teams that are back-to-back. 52.8% ATS on the rested team. 54.9% ATS when their opponent won by single digits the day before. Again, this is a hard-fought game. They just won by single digits. It goes up to 54.9% ATS. You filter that down by favorites of 5.5 points or less or an underdog in this spot. 166 ATS, 60.2%. Um, so definitely the rested teams, while they may get a bit of a slow start because the other team has been playing and is accustomed to this gym and the long term, it, it will, um, it will even itself out and even more with the rested teams being good. I will say that I I think that the, the second half of these rested teams would have even more value. I, I don't have a way to search that, but I would guess that, you know, in the first half, they got to get things going a little bit in the second half, these rested teams likely do even better. Yeah, that angle makes a lot of sense. And in fact, you know, as we're looking here, we do have some more data to back that up in terms of looking at the first half and and some over and under and ATS trends for that. Yeah, first half only underdogs of five and a half points or more in the first half are 53 and a half percent ATS since 2005, 244 and 212 ATS there. Um, And also unders 52 and a half percent in first half of conference tournaments since 2005. The under's done a little bit better in the first half than does in the full game. Again, I think this makes sense because, you know, at the end of the game, you can get some epic foul fests in these conference tournaments. Teams don't want their season to be over. And you have the uh, a lot of games are in locations that you're not used to playing in. And in the first half, the shooting numbers would likely be even worse. All right. So as we get into these conference tournament breakdowns here, I know we had listener questions regarding money line rollovers, regarding tournament venues that were very good for the over very good for the under we'll work those in to our breakdowns here of these conference tournaments we will hit seven of them here on today's show from this point forward again my apologies for the technical issues today that kind of pushed back the uh, release time for today's show i know it's important to get this out with three conference tournaments today but you know things happen and i apologize for that but let's go ahead and get into these here beginning with the patriot league now again This is one of those conferences that wasn't regularly lined up until this season. We've done all of our conference breakdowns, so our listeners have a little bit of an idea of what to expect with these teams here. You've got Colgate, the favorite, plus 130 over at five dimes, plus 110 at bet online. Bucknell, plus 190. Lehigh, plus 550. American, plus 900. Nobody else really has a chance to win this conference tournament. As always, shop around for the best prices, but Let's start to break this thing down here, Kyle. What are you seeing from the Patriot League? Well, to me, you look at Colgate, they get the top seed thanks to Bucknell really struggling at the end of the season. Uh, You know, that's key for having home games here, certainly. Higher seed hosting. Um, You know, there's nothing strong here for over-unders. If you look back at the Patriot League, it's almost exactly 50-50. Definitely pace wars in this conference. Um, you know, there's plenty of teams that want to play fast, plenty of teams that want to slow it down. I don't think this draw is as straightforward as it looks, though. I think Colgate, uh, you know, being the favorite in the betting market, and yesterday they were even a bigger betting favorite. Um, I mean, it makes sense that the top seed's a little bit of a favorite, I would say. But, um, you know, they have home court advantage, but they don't have an easy draw. If Boston U wins that first game, Boston U already won at Colgate earlier this year. Uh, Colgate beat American twice. If American would play them after that, um, they beat them by four points, and that was a comeback win. American was ahead most of that game, and then once by over in overtime by two points. So, American has uh, arguably the best player in this conference in Nelson. So, I think Colgate has a difficult draw there at the top. Uh, you know, Bucknell's been here before, knows how to win it. Number one in defensive efficiency in the league. Certainly, you can say that Bucknell didn't finish the the year out very well, and that I would agree with that. But you know, having won this before, I think means quite a bit. Um, I like Bucknell some in this uh, conference, certainly. 
Uh, Lehigh, I wanted to mention, I, I can't take them here. They're 0-4 against Bucknell and Colgate, number seven in defensive efficiency in the league. Uh, to me, you know, this is a team that they have a good offense. They can outscore you sometimes, but I don't want to count on them to have to do that every game because they don't have a defense and they haven't proven they could beat the top teams in the league. And to me, that's a pretty big red flag. When I put up this conference tournament preview, I mean, I hit these pretty quickly after the odds were released yesterday, posting them at bangthebook.com. Colgate was in the plus 110 range, Bucknell plus 215, American plus 725. American has gone up now to plus 900. But you and I were talking yesterday, this Colgate price was getting out of control. Somebody that really liked Colgate was hammering them over and over and over again. You wound up catching Bucknell at plus 460, which is a phenomenal price grab in the Patriot League here. So kudos to you for that. But, you know, the team that is really intriguing to me is American because American is a team here that draws a very weak five seed in Navy in the first game. And then, as you mentioned, played Colgate very tough early on. The thing is, we have to weigh whether plus 900 is worth it or the money line rollover is worth it. Yeah, I think the money line rollover would probably be better in this case. If you look at, um, you know, this conference, there are a lot of close games in this conference, so they won't be a huge underdog. But uh, I know that American, their price has moved around around a lot. I mean, honestly, in general, this conference, the odds have been very strange. Like you said, you know, Colgate, I think, was minus 180 or minus 170 at one point. And then also, I know American was plus 1,200 last night, so the price has gotten worse there since last night. Uh, at plus 1,200, I probably would have taken the futures price. I think now the money line rollover makes sense. Uh, you know, And as we say in the past, and I'll go ahead and just uh, tease it a little bit here now, money line rollover is the biggest positive to them is you don't have to worry about how to hedge. Um, you can just bet the money line, roll it over to the next game, and then whenever you want to stop, you can just stop or you can even bet less. You know, you don't have to put everything you just had from the game before into it. So uh, I think it's easier to to figure out what to do in the next game. Well, and of course, as we look at this, we don't have odds out for Thursday's American versus Navy game. American is at home in that game. They will be a cl- pretty clear favorite in that spot. I'm thinking, what, Kyle, maybe six, seven points, something like that, maybe even Uh, a little bit bigger of a number there, but they would be a dog. Keep in mind, this is a home court advantage tournament. So they would be a dog on the road at Colgate. They would be a dog on the road at Bucknell. That's why you think about the money line rollover because you start with a position. You know, let's say that you have to start with just to make the math easy, 250 to win a hundred on the American money line on Thursday. Then you've got 350 to roll into them as an underdog against Colgate. Let's say they're maybe, you know, plus 150 there. So you've got your 350 investment plus 150. You win that one. Then you go on. You've got the Bucknell game. As you go through this here, you're going to yield more of a return than plus 900 in most cases with American, unless there's some weird upset or something like that, which is why the money line rollover makes sense. Yeah, I think so too. And, and uh, I think uh, Colgate would likely be favored by six and a half or seven points against American. So, Uh, That being the case, then you get a pretty decent price on the money line just in that game. So, um, you know, I think that a lot of these, uh, we talked about this yesterday, I'd say maybe somewhere in the 80, 85 percent range, the money line rollover is probably going to uh, finish ahead of the futures price. Certainly there's sometimes that you can get a strange futures price to where it'll make more sense. But uh, the money line rollovers is obviously uh, some downside to that that you have to remember to roll it over and bet the next game. You know, if you're very busy the next day, uh, you might miss the the tip off or if you had the futures price, you'd already have it. Um, but at the same time, you get the uh, positive about hedging because I, I know that hedging can be pretty complicated on futures. And it's something that we get quite a few questions about that. You know, how much do I put on this team? You know, how much will I have left if they lose this game or if they win this game and keep going? Um you know, it's certainly easier if you have a money line rollover, like I said, because then you can just decide you want to bet less on it or you want to stop. And if you stop, then you just win what you had. Right. And, and in a lot of cases, it's going to be really easy to see these when the team is going to be a dog in all of their games, because then it's just, you know, very simple math, because you can start with the hundred dollar position or whatever, and then you can see it, you know, gradually increase. And then it's very easy to do the math and see it go higher uh, than the futures price. Here, because you have to put out the bigger initial investment on American, because they'll be a clear favorite in that first game, 
it's a little bit different. But again, as you said, a couple of really big advantages, higher profit potential, and also you hedge by not betting it anymore or by betting a smaller amount. So it gives you a much better opportunity there with that. <laughs> Excuse me. We will get some better examples of this than American as we go throughout the conference tournaments here. And one of them specifically that we'll talk about tomorrow, East Tennessee State in the SOCON. But we move on to the Big South Conference Tournament here. This is another one at campus sites to a degree. The first round at the campus sites. The quarterfinals and the semifinals at the number one seed, which is the Campbell Fighting Camels here this time. And then the highest remaining seed hosts the championship game on Sunday. So first games at campus sites, quarterfinals and semis at Campbell. Then the championship at Campbell if they get there but at the highest seeded team if they don't. So what are you looking at here in the Big South, Kyle? Well, first thing is I want to say that favorites of seven and a half points or less in this conference tournament are 32 and 21 in the last 53. So uh, small favorites have done well here in the Big South. Uh, You know, I think that this is an interesting conference and that Radford seems like they're the best team in this conference. I, I do think that they are the best team in this conference, but they have two tough losses against Campbell. They blew a lead in both of those games. Uh, you got Chris Clemens, a lot of fun to watch there at Campbell. Uh, definitely can carry his team. I still think that Radford, you know, is the team that I that I like in this conference. I like their non-conference schedule. I like that they played up in the non-conference, that they were able to win some of those games. And they have a pretty veteran team, a good coach. Uh, plus 200 now in five dimes. I like Radford here. I think that they would be the one that I would play uh, if you're just looking for who you think will actually win this conference tournament. Another team that I wanted to say here, Hampton. I think Hampton's a team to watch here because they match up pretty well against Campbell. And you look at the regular season, they beat them once. They lost once by three points. Uh, Jermaine Marrow, a star here for Hampton. Uh, I think he's capable of taking over a game. Certainly so is Chris Clemens. And, uh, you know, you have to give a shout out to the Fighting Camels. That's a pretty awesome uh, nickname. But, you know, I don't I don't want to discount Campbell in this one, but I do think that they might be a weaker one seed than some of the seeds that we see uh, at the top line in a lot of the other conferences. If you look at Hampton, last year they were one win from the NCAA tournament in the MEAC. Now they go over to the Big South. I mean, I think Hampton could make a run here. I, I don't think that they'll win this conference tournament, but I think a Hampton money line rollover makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, my pick to win it here would be Radford. Uh, last night it was plus 160. It's plus 200 now. I do like Radford and I like Hampton money line rollover here. Radford plus 200 Campbell again, the host team for the quarters and the semis and the championship game. If they got there plus 250 Winthrop plus 445 Gardner Webb plus 900 Charleston Southern is the team that I like here as a little bit of a longer shot. They're plus 1100 in this one. Uh, they were plus 700 when the odds opened. So much better price. Now I'd have to actually take a look and see how the money line rollover would look with them. They do play tonight, but they play USC Upstate. They're a two-touchdown favorite in that game. Then they would play Winthrop Thursday afternoon. They lost to Winthrop twice, but they lost by four points and then lost in double overtime by two points. So Charleston Southern, who split with Radford, only lost by a point to Campbell. They're the team that I like here in this conference where the money line rollover probably would make more sense. Yeah, I think so as well. And I, I think that makes sense also because I, I'm trying to stay away from Winthrop here. Yeah, I think that they have too many turnover problems. They're not very good defensively this year. I know Winthrop's done well in the past. Uh, they don't really have the veteran presence that they've had a lot of other times in the past. I think this Winthrop team is weaker than a lot of those teams we've seen. Certainly, I think the Charleston Southern uh, side looks like a decent underdog as well. And I do think the money line rollover would be a good way to go in that one. I think Radford wins this conference tournament, so I like plus 200. Um, I, I think Hampton and Charleston Southern are pretty good sleepers as well. Well, and again, you look at Charleston Southern here, you don't start the money line rollover tonight because they're a 14.5-point favorite. There's absolutely no reason to start at that point. But there'll be a dog to Winthrop on Thursday. There'll be a dog to Radford on Friday. And they would be a dog in the championship game in all likelihood on Sunday. So that's why you start to look at a money line rollover, because if you've got a team that's an underdog in three straight games and you can roll that over, you roll your hundred dollar bet over with three underdog plays. That's got to be worth more, certainly than the 700 that was out there at first and probably more than the 1100 right now as well. 
Yeah, it, it had been way more than 700, and it's like a little bit more than uh, 1,100 as well. You know, I think that uh, this is a conference where, you know, it's not easy to say who's going to win this one. And I think Radford, if they had hosted this tournament, you know, would have been a pretty big favorite. But since they don't get it at home, you know, they're plus 200 instead. Uh, to me, that gives you value on Radford. I think they're the best team. But, you know, there are plenty of openings in this tournament in that, you know, I don't I don't really think that the the one seed, the three seed are very strong, which gives you some shots to try to take some of these money line rollovers because then you have some teams that even if they don't win at all, they could make a pretty decent run here. Well, and another thing you can do with these conference tournaments here, and, and I realize we're spending a lot of time on the Big South, but this one sets up pretty well for a lot of our talking points. You take Charleston Southern and Radford as sort of double teaming on Winthrop right. because, you know, as yeah. you said, you don't think Winthrop's a very good team, a lot of turnover problems. Well, if Charleston Southern beats Winthrop, then you're free rolling in the semifinals with both Win or with both Charleston Southern and Radford. You're guaranteed to get one of those teams in the championship game against probably a weak number one in Campbell. So you're basically double teaming the three seed that you think is pretty weak. And you can do that as almost a hedge against Charleston Southern as well. Yeah, definitely. I like that type of strategy where, you know, you might have a chance of being uh, being there on both sides. And if you're there on both sides, like you said, then you're going to have one team at least get through. I will point out that, I, you know, when I say Campbell's a weaker one seed, uh, Winthrop's a weaker three seed, I'm not saying that they can't win this conference tournament. Uh, certainly that could happen and it won't shock me. I just think that it creates value because I think more times than not, uh, more times than what the price shows right now, uh, you would have some value going with the underdog based on the fact that those teams have shown question marks. You know, they're not the the really strong one seed or the really strong three seed that really proved a lot in non-conference slate or just beat up on teams in the conference. So I think that just gives us a chance to look for these values. All right, so we move on to the Horizon League tournament, which starts tonight. Games on the campus sites. There's two tonight, I believe, and then two tomorrow. And then next week we go out to... Uh, Little Caesars Arena in Detroit for this one. Northern Kentucky is the two seed, but the favorite, plus 160. Wright State, the number one seed, plus 210. Oakland is the three, they're plus 500. Green Bay is the four, they're 975. Illinois, Chicago, UIC is the five, they're 1400. The number eight seed, IUPUI, who plays Wright State tonight and is a seven and a half point dog, is next at plus 1500. Then Detroit Mercy and Youngstown State to round this thing out. So first let's start with the venue here for little Caesars arena coming up next week, Monday, Tuesdays when they'll be in Detroit. This is a relatively new host for this tournament. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's not much data to go on here. Just a slight nudge to the under based on the results uh, of recent, but I would say that I think this, this venue should play to the under some it's 20,000 seat complex horizon league teams are not used to playing in that. They're also not going to have these seats full, obviously. There's no, no way they're going to be that many people show up uh, to watch this conference tournament. And we've talked about in the past that it's a negative for shooting and the shooting backdrop when you have a massive facility and, you know, a very small amount of people in it. I, I don't want to guess how many people will be there. I just know it won't be even close to 20,000. Uh, you know, when you get a massive uh, arena like that and there's so many empty seats, it's a little bit harder to shoot. You know, you see so many empty seats. You're also not used to how deep the backdrop is, things like that. When you're, you know, playing in uh, venues where there aren't near as many seats normally. So I, I think that even though the Little Caesars Arena, we don't have much data on it. I think it certainly nudges to the under, um, at least some. And I will say that the Horizon League has been a pretty good under league this year because there's so many inefficient offenses. The teams that play really fast, so you get some high totals, but they don't make that many shots. So um, certainly would lean toward the under in the games that get to Little Caesars Arena. Well, and as we look at the Horizon League as a whole here, there are some shenanigans in this conference tournament. Two number four seeds and a number two seed the last three years. In 2014, a number five seed won. And the last two years in the conference tournament title game, a number eight seed in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and a number 10 seed in Cleveland. I think maybe it's the other way around. Uh, but either way, an eight seed and a 10 seed have been the losers in the conference tournament championship game. So this thing can be very wide open. Absolutely. It's been one of the most wide open of all of them. 
And, uh, you know, I was looking at yesterday with the, the odds on five dimes, the number one through C- three seed wins the Horizon League Championship. I think yesterday it was minus 325 or somewhere in that range. Today it's only minus 275. So likely somebody has been betting the number four through eight seed to win the Horizon League Championship. I wouldn't blame you, you know, at plus 235 now. It, it was better priced than that before. Um, like you said, some strange things have happened here. Will I be surprised if something like that happens this year? No, I really won't. The question is, who could it be? You know, and and I think UIC has a chance of being it. Um, I'm pretty confident if UIC is the one that you could do better than plus 1,400 on a money line rollover. Uh, I mean, because they're an underdog right off the bat. So, um, you know, they're going to be an underdog every single game. Uh, I think you get better than plus 1,400. I, I honestly think that anybody who plays against Wright State in that second game if they get past IUPUI, which they probably will, because IUPUI has been in pretty bad form here of late. But whoever plays that game, uh, Wright State versus either Green Bay or UIC, uh, could could have a run here. I mean, I, I think that Wright State's certainly beatable. Uh, if you look at Wright State, the w- one reason uh, I want to say there's a couple of reasons why I'm going against Wright State or I would look to go against Wright State here. A tough path. I mean, even IUPUI, even though I think they'll beat them, not an easy game for them. Uh, UIC or Green Bay, I think, is a very tough matchup. And number two, Wright State has been really, really bad against zone defenses this year. Uh, according to Synergy Sports, they rank in the top 24% in the country in offensive efficiency against man defense. They rank in the bottom 5% of all teams in the country against a zone defense. Now, you know somebody's going to put a zone up against them because everybody can see that data. Um, you know, that that's one of those things where – Coaches are going to watch the tape. They're going to see the data. Somebody's going to try his own defense against Wright State. And you got a new shooting backdrop there at Little Caesars Arena. I think this sets up pretty badly here for Wright State. Yeah, I agree. Wright State has a really, really tough draw. One of my video picks over on our Bang Book YouTube page today was IUPUI plus the points. No, they haven't played particularly well. But in their last six games, their losses are by a combined 23 points. They lost their last game by 11 points. Uh, to Detroit or to Oakland before that five games, you know, with their losses by a combined 11 or 12 points. So, you know, they were playing a lot of close games. They just weren't winning them. They should play a close game again tonight. And then if you run into green Bay or Illinois, Chicago in that semifinal game next Monday, both of those teams like to play at a quicker tempo as well. Green Bay specifically top 10 in the country in tempo. Then you've got to turn around and play probably Northern Kentucky on Tuesday Northern Kentucky is a team that both you and I like here as well. Yeah, I think Northern Kentucky is is likely the best team in this uh, conference. Drew McDonald has been injured. Uh, he came back and played pretty well in his first game back here. So I hope that he is healthy because certainly he means a lot to this Northern Kentucky team. If you know anything about uh, Northern Kentucky, you know that everything runs through Drew McDonald, uh, veteran leader. I like that Northern Kentucky has what you know I would consider one of the best coaches here. They've had a lot of success in this uh, conference in the past. I think that, you know, success can breed success and things like this because you get to that point, uh, you're not in all of the big stage. So I like Northern Kentucky as the team that I think will win this conference tournament. Uh, I also like if you look at Northern Kentucky's draw, I mean, look at who they have. Well, I've heard some people say Northern Kentucky has to play against teams who are so close to home, you know, um, at Little Caesars Arena. Uh, this, this is one where, well, first of all, uh, is, is it the home teams or people hosting the first game? Is that right, Adam? Yeah. So Detroit has to go to Northern Kentucky and then Northern Kentucky would play at little Caesars arena in the semifinals. Correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. So they'd only have one game like that. Uh, Detroit would not have any kind of home court advantage. Uh, you got Northern Kentucky. Look at the amount of points they put up against Detroit in those two games. Detroit's defense, very weak. If they get past them in that game, they play Oakland or Youngstown State, who could pull that upset. I like Campy. He's a good coach for Oakland, but Oakland's defense is really bad as well. Northern Kentucky is the one balanced team down in the bottom of that bracket. I think this bracket sets up really well for them to be in the championship game. Uh, It wouldn't surprise me if we see like a Northern Kentucky versus UIC championship or Northern Kentucky versus Green Bay, something like that. That's why I think it makes a lot of sense to play Northern Kentucky as the team that's most likely to win this conference tournament and then put something small on one of the teams from the top as well. Yeah. Northern Kentucky plus plus one forty over at bet online plus one sixty 
at five dimes. So again, shop around for the best price, but it does look like Northern Kentucky are the team that you and I both like here in this conference tournament. So again, I apologize for the technical issues here today. I will get this up as quickly as possible to get thoughts out on those three conference tournaments that start tonight. But we shift our focus to Wednesday here. Talk about the Northeast Conference. And really, this is a hard conference to peg because you've got St. Francis, Pennsylvania, plus 185, Fairleigh Dickinson, plus 210, Sacred Heart, plus 380, Bobby Morris, plus 800, then plus 1800 on down from there. And I mean, look, we talked about this. The winner of this conference plays a 16 versus 16 play in game in Dayton and probably gets beaten there. Yeah, likely. Um, you know, I hope you have a stronger a team that you like more than I do in this one. I, I'd, I'd like to give you something that I really like here. Um, I, I just really don't like anything in this conference. I will say a couple stats here. The underdog, 41 and 25 ATS in the last 66 uh, in this conference tournament. Dogs of three points or more, 37 and 20 ATS. So we see a lot of close games here. That makes a lot of sense to me. There's no dominant team. No team that's just going to run away with it here. I think St. Francis is probably the best team in this conference. Uh, we talked about them, what was it, last week? It was pretty recently. Um, you know, their value was only it was only plus 120 last night, so the odds have certainly gotten better on them here today. Uh, I, I think uh, they're the best team in this conference, but I don't think there's any wide margin as you look at it because they've been tripped up by a lot of teams in this tournament or in this conference throughout the year. I think that this is one where you could see some, you know, really low uh, rated team that you wouldn't expect get pretty far in it as well. So maybe you want to take some kind of really long shot here. Um, Fairly Dickinson, a team that I usually wouldn't like because they're jump shot heavy, though they have some really good metrics on the road this season. Um, uh, Haslam Metrics, another good uh, website to look at, has them in the top 30 in uh, performance on the road so far this season. So I like that, that they, even though they're a jump shot heavy team, they've been able to make those shots on the road. They've been able to win a lot of games that way. So, so maybe a little bit of value with them, but only, you know, just a little over plus 200. So I, I can't say that I like anything very much here. Yeah, there, there's really not a whole lot that I like here either. One thing that is kind of interesting here and one thing that could add some potential value uh, to the St. Francis PA side is that this tournament, this conference tournament does reseed after the first round game. Yeah. So if there's an upset, St. Francis theoretically could face an eight and a six or an eight and a seven, something like that in the first two games here, uh, which would obviously give them a pretty good advantage on Saturday. But also this is a St. Francis team that lost to the eighth seed, lost to the seventh seed and lost to the sixth seed during the regular season. So there's obviously no guarantee that Saturday goes any better for them uh, based on you know who they wind up facing. I kind of liked Robert Morris a little bit just because they started really well in conference play seven and one, but then went four and six the rest of the way and lost to the two teams that didn't even qualify for the conference tournament. So kind of hard to like them, hard to like St. Francis. This is a conference tournament that I'm going to stay away from. I don't see a whole lot of value. If I had to do something because St. Francis, Pennsylvania could get lucky with that draw in the event of an upset at plus 160, I guess they've got the best chance. Yeah, and plus plus one eighty five. So I mean, it's it's one of those where, uh, I, if I had to bet it, I'd bet that as well. But I, I don't have to bet it. We don't have to bet this one. So I, I'm not going to bet this one. I, we have tons of conference tournaments to talk about, and I think there's going to be better values elsewhere. And the next two conference tournaments we're going to talk about very very interesting. I really love the Ohio Valley Conference Tournament. I think it's probably my favorite low major conference tournament here. Uh, of this conference tournament cycle. You've got four teams that are very, very good in this conference. I would say three probably that actually have a good shot to win it. Belmont, your favorite, plus 110. Murray State, your second favorite, plus 155. Those two teams get double buys into the semifinals. So huge advantage for Belmont and Murray State. Jacksonville State, plus 725. Austin P plus 1100. Nobody else has a shot, and the odds reflect that. Interesting thing about the venue here for this tournament, it's no longer at the National Municipal Auditorium like it used to be. Had a new venue last year, and they're back there again this year. Yeah, and that, that's a bummer for total spatters because the Nashville venue was an under machine. Uh, you know, this was a great one to just bet the under and forget about it, especially the first half under. Uh, Ford Center, new venue. 
unknown to me whether this is a good one for the under or not. Uh, last year, it, it wasn't particularly good for the under, but it's one year. You know, I think we need to give this one a little bit of time. Um, you know, I think that Belmont makes sense to be the favorite here. Uh, Murray State, easily the second favorite. Look, those two are favored by so much because of the setup of this conference tournament. Like you said, the double buy, we rarely see that now. Um, you know, th- that makes a big difference. You know, you, you play one last game, one less chance of having a really poor shooting night. Uh, Jacksonville State, a distant third. Um, I have to say that I think uh, Murray State's a little bit overvalued here. I know that a lot of people won't like that. Um, Morant is a tremendous player. I have nothing negative to say about him. I think he'll be a good NBA player. But the group around him is not as good as Murray State usually has. I, you know, he's gotten a lot of publicity this year as well. Uh, I think Murray State has one massive weakness, and that's defensive rebounding. And two of the other top teams here in this league can take advantage of that in Jacksonville State and Austin P. Um, Jacksonville State beat Murray State bad in the one game that they played against them there. Um, I think it was a 20-point win. So you've got a Murray State team that I think is a little bit overvalued. Belmont, I can't say anything negative about them. You know, they're very good every year, very well coached. To me, though, you look at this conference tournament, I think you and I are on the same page here. Uh, Ray Harper, a really good coach. Jacksonville State, the third most experienced team in the conference. I have to like Jacksonville State here. Um, I think you would get better price, certainly, than plus 725 on a money line rollover. They have to play more games. I know it. It would not surprise me if Jacksonville State wins this conference tournament. I think they certainly have a chance to do so. Um, You know, the, the schedule sets up pretty well for them in that they stay away from Belmont. I like Jacksonville State here. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those where I would look to take a position on Belmont. I know they're the favorite at plus 110, but they're the best team in this conference and that double buy very advantageous. And furthermore, Austin P is a much easier semifinal game than Jacksonville State. So I take Belmont plus the 110 and then look at the Jacksonville State money line rollover as well. And you don't need to start that Jacksonville State rollover until you get to that game against Murray State because they'll be a big favorite against Eastern Illinois or UT Martin, so I wouldn't worry about it there. I would look for a two-game money line rollover on Jacksonville State with Murray State and Belmont. And obviously, if you've got Belmont in pocket at plus 110, you free roll the championship game if Jacksonville State gets it. Right, yeah. I mean, you just have to watch what what amount you put on each side there. You know, you wouldn't want to bet Belmont huge and then just have Jacksonville State as a small play. But, uh, you know... Watch your unit sizes. I think that Belmont is certainly deserving as a favorite here. Uh, the Bruins, like I said, I can't really see anything negative about them. They're always very good. The best coach in the conference. I think Harper's the second best, best coach in this conference, though. Um, I think a Belmont-Jacksonville State final here is, is pretty likely. All right, so we move to the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament here. And, you know, this one... It looks a lot different when you don't have teams like Creighton or Wichita State in the field. This year, it is very, very spread out. Probably the most spread out I can remember this thing being. Loyola Chicago plus 180, Drake plus 400, Southern Illinois 550, Missouri State 575, Bradley 850, Northern Iowa 1200. Even teams like Illinois State only 1800, Indiana State 2200, Valpo and Evansville 5000. The first thing we have to talk about, though, with this conference tournament is the venue in St. Louis. Yeah, the under is 84 and 43 in the last 127 Missouri Valley Conference Tournament contests. Uh, 66.1% unders. That's pretty impressive over that period of time. The number goes up to 68.6% unders on totals of 120 or higher. So I'm, I'm not saying 140 or something really high. 120 or higher, 68.6% unders. Scott Trade Center, proven very, very good under arena. I don't think we'll have a better under arena in any of the games we talk about. The only other one that could be is Madison Square Garden. You know, it, And Scott Trade is right up there with it, which is saying a lot because MSG is a proven very good under arena. Uh, the caveat I have about this one, though, everybody knows this now. You know, a, a few, um, a few t- years ago, you would have had you know, 130s and and the line would just stay put. Now you're going to have 125 is what it opens at, and then it's going to tank down to 120. Or, you know, somebody's going to bet it down hard. 
So if you like the under here in any of these games, I really suggest you bet it early rather than late. I think, uh, you know, it's really impressive to me that they've had that many unders against the closing line, even though the last couple of years it has been getting bet down pretty consistently. Um, this is a conference tournament that it would be, I, I just would not play an over here. The question is whether I play an under or not. I think the value is not nearly as good as what it would have been a few years ago. But, you know, Scott Trade Center, an arena where I don't want any part of the over. So as we look at this conference center, by the way, they renamed this arena the Enterprise Center, different naming rights. So just so nobody gets confused, it's still the same venue, just the Enterprise Center this time around instead of the Scott Trade Center. So don't get confused by that. It is still the same building, still the same under machine, still the same bad shooting backdrop. Now, this conference tournament starts on Thursday. The 8-9 game, then the 7-10 game. The 8-9 winner, who plays at 6.05 Central Time on Thursday, plays Loyola Chicago at 12.05 in the afternoon on Friday. Huge advantage to Loyola Chicago over either Indiana State or Valparaiso. Not so bad for the 7-10 game that plays Drake at 6.05. So what do you think about teams for this thing? Obviously, it's an under-machine kind of arena, and you know, hey, maybe that affects the teams that you want to take too because you want to look at teams that you know play really good defense because they get an inherent advantage here. But, man, this thing's wide open. Yeah, I, I will say, I think the Missouri Valley Conference is much weaker than it was a few years ago. You know, I, I watched quite a bit of MVC basketball this year. I was not impressed with the, the level of play. A few years ago, this was a really good mid-major they're not near as good as they were a few years ago. I will say that I think that Loyola Chicago is the team with the highest upside here. I don't really want to take any sleeper team around them because they're so good on defense. They play the way that they they want to play. They're going to make you play slow. They're going to win with defense, taking care of the basketball. Uh, this, is a, this is a good Loyola Chicago team that kind of underachieved throughout the course of the season. Wouldn't want to go against them. I think that Drake is a nice story. I think the first year coach Darian DeVries did a tremendous job. I think they're very vulnerable as a two seed though. So I'm looking for value against them. So you go to the bottom of the bracket and you say, you know, who, who do I like in the bottom of the bracket? I think there are two, two options here that I'd, I'd be fine with taking one is Southern Illinois, uh, Southern Illinois, a pretty, uh, pretty good team. Well coached. Um, they have some depth, they can play different ways. They can play a little faster. If you want to play faster, they can slow it down. Drake wants to push the pace. So Drake is one of the rare teams in this conference that wants to play faster. The other team that I would say in the bottom, Illinois State. Look, Illinois State was a massive underachiever in the regular season here. They lost two games by the half-court buzzer beaters. That's going to bother you. I mean, if you lose two games that way, you're going to have trouble bouncing back from that. Illinois State did have trouble with that. Illinois State lost a lot of close games. Before the season, they were picked by most people to be either second or third in this conference. And now they've got the seventh seed. I have to like them some here because Illinois State should beat Evansville in that first game. We obviously wouldn't guarantee it because they've been so inconsistent. Then they play Drake, who Drake has had a tough time matching up against them this year. And as I said, I think Drake is a week two seed. So Illinois State has a real shot to win a couple games here. And then if they go play Southern Illinois or Northern Iowa, certainly that's a winnable game for them. So I think Illinois State, uh, either plus 1,800 or money line rollover, and I think that might be pretty close as to which would be better because Illinois State is going to be respected by the books more than the average seven seed would be. Yeah, I like this. You know, this is sort of like the same concept that we talked about in terms of teaming up on Winthrop where, you know, I like Illinois State against Drake. I like Southern Illinois against Drake. I even to a degree like Northern Iowa against Drake. Right. Drake just feels like a vulnerable two seed, as you mentioned. You know, I kind of liked Southern Illinois at first, but, you know, the price on Southern Illinois plus 550, way different than the price on Illinois State plus 1800. And Illinois State shouldn't have a problem in that first game against Evansville. They'll be a pretty clear favorite, should take care of business there. Yeah, the fourth game doesn't really help, I guess, but it shouldn't lead to that big of a price gap between them and Southern Illinois. Now, Southern Illinois does have a coin flip game against Northern Iowa on Friday night. That worries me for the Salukis. If they had an easier first game, I would look to take them. But because there's a decent chance they lose that game to the Panthers, it is a little bit more difficult to take them. I think you've convinced me here on Illinois State. And again, the nice thing about Illinois State is if you don't want to take them against Loyola Chicago, if you're doing a money line rollover, 
you just stop. Right, right. And if they get to Loyola Chicago and you have plus team, plus 1,800, then you're going to have plenty of room to hedge out if you do that as well. But uh, I, I think that, um, you know, the thing that makes me not like Southern Illinois quite as much as I would have is exactly what you just said. Southern Illinois plays a tough game against Northern Iowa. You know, I don't know if they'll win that game. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I don't think that's much of an easier game than Illinois State against Drake. You know, I mean, is Northern Iowa that much worse than Drake? I don't think so. I mean, uh, they on a neutral, they would be pretty close. So I think Illinois State, you know, just because they're at such a bigger price, uh, that's the way I have to look. And I do think, like I said, I think Loyola Chicago is the favorite for a reason. So if you like Loyola Chicago, you could also take Loyola and take Illinois State. It wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing either. Yeah, that's also a good idea. Again, attacking it kind of from both sides there, as we talked about a little bit uh, with the, the Big South Conference Tournament. I agree. I think that's a, a strategy. 180 is enough on Loyola Chicago. I think because of their level of consistency relative to the rest of this conference, it's probably good enough to take, I think. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, we might get a little bit better price here. I know that these prices have moved around and they usually get a little bit better later. They kind of tighten up uh, less use on them. So, you know, you might get a plus 200 on Loyola. If you do, I think that's a good price. Uh, I think they're the most likely winner of this tournament. And obviously, if Loyola played against a team like Illinois State, they'd be at a big advantage based on Illinois State having to play so many games to get there. All right. So like I said, we had some technical issues here, (laughs) excuse me, uh, with the first run that we took at today's show because of Blog Talk Radio. At least we can make up some time here by talking about the West Coast Conference because, yeah, uh, this is a one-team race. The only team that can beat Gonzaga is themselves. They are minus 1050 to win this conference tournament. They won every conference game in the regular season by at least 12 points. St. Mary's plus 750, BYU plus 3000, San Francisco plus 5000, San Diego plus 8500, everybody else on down from there. Is there any betting value here in the West Coast Conference tournament? Well, the, the lowest that I see on Gonzaga is minus 850. And I, I mean, that. That might be a decent price, but I'm not going to recommend taking minus 850. I can't do that. You know, I feel like if we say take a team minus 850, we sound pretty bad. You know, I mean, who really wants to lay 850 on a conference tournament? I don't. I won't do it. Um, I think Gonzaga is going to win this conference tournament. I think everybody knows that. You know, I mean, uh, you pointed out what Gonzaga was last year. What was it? Minus 200? Yeah, boy, it'd be nice to go back to that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I tell you what, if they were minus two hundred, I'd be all over it. But uh, so would everybody I think else. If I remember correctly, we were all over it last year with Gonzaga minus two hundred, and it closed higher than that. Yeah, I think I remember that as well. I mean, this this is one where there's there's less of a threat to them this year than there was last season. St. Mary's is not as good as they were. Uh, San Francisco looked like they had some potential earlier this year, and they really. Uh, fizzled out later in the season. BYU, Yoli Child's a really good player. They don't have as much depth, though. I mean, it, it'd be stunning if anybody else wins this uh, tournament. I will say that the only thing I may do here in this one is take a San Diego money line rollover. Uh, San Diego is a team that has played pretty well this year. I like their balance on offense and defense. I would definitely stop before Gonzaga. I will say that. So, and again, I, I'd bet this one really small if I did because. It's hard to find much value here. I did want to say, as far as the venue, the over is 60 and 48 in the last uh, 108 here at the West Coast Conference Tournament. Orleans Arena is not known for a bad, bad backdrop, so overs would be fine here. Uh, totals of 148 and a half or higher at Orleans Arena in this conference tournament are 8 and 1 to the over. I know that's not a big uh, sample size, so I don't read a lot into that. I will just say that it, you can get some high-scoring games here some shootouts in this one. And, and let's be honest, why are there some shootouts in, in these? Because Gonzaga is putting up huge point totals. Well, and again, the reason why you look at the money line rollover for San Diego, instead of playing the plus 8,500 is because you don't want to have to hedge Gonzaga as no. what, probably a minus 3000 money line favorite in the championship game. I mean, that just feels like it's not really worth it. So you just take San Diego on the money line rollover to beat BYU and beat uh, St. Mary's is, would be what you're looking for here in this conference tournament to try and extract some value. But as Kyle said, at least the over looks like something you can do with those late night degenerate specials here on conference tournament week. So we got through all seven. I think we did so in, in a pretty reasonable amount of time here. We'll touch on five more 
on tomorrow's show. That will be the MAAC, the SOCON, the America East, the Colonial, and the Summit. Kyle Hunter, professional handicapper over at huntersportspicks.com. What's going on at the website right now, man? Lower the prices here for March Madness uh, package. You can check that out at huntersportspicks.com. Also doing a totals only special. Uh, totals certainly my specialty, and I think everybody knows that that's listened here. I'm going to do 299 bucks for all my totals the rest of this season. Mention bang the book. Uh, message me Kyle at huntersportspicks.com or at Kyle Hunter Picks on Twitter. And, of course, you can check out Kyle's daily article over at bangthebook.com and also yesterday posted his situational spots piece for this week here with the rest of the regular season, 19 conferences still doing the regular season in college basketball. So, Kyle Hunter, huntersportspicks.com, at Kyle Hunter Picks on Twitter. Thank you so much for your patience and flexibility today, man, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Sounds good. Talk to you then.